Raywin Connell is Professor Emerita at the University of Sydney and one of Australia's leading social scientists. Her most recent books are Southern Theory, 2007, about social thought beyond the global metropole, gender in world perspective, and that's the one going into its third edition. Is it Raywin? Next, Next month, and Raywin said, just in time for Christmas. <laughs> so I'm sure you have people on your list and you're just not quite sure. Uh, maybe you bought them the t-shirt already. Uh, <laughs> you can get the, um, the book. Her other books include Masculinity, Schools and Social Justice, Ruling Class, Ruling Culture, Gender and Power, and Making the Difference. Her work is widely cited internationally and it's been translated into 18 languages. She's taught at universities in Australia, Canada and the USA in departments of sociology, political science and education, and is a long-term participant in the labour movement and peace movement. Please join me in welcoming Raven. Thank you very much. And um, thank you for the invitation to be here. I'm, I'm honoured to be asked. And the, the subject of this conference is indeed very dear to my heart. Um, and it's been a good occasion for me to rethink some issues and think about uh, where my work, um, uh, as well as the work of many other people, is now heading. So what I want to do is talk about uh, a little bit about where we've come from in this field, uh, the way that the field of, of work, politics and, and practice has been changing recently, and what kind of an uh, agenda for feminist work in education uh, might be emerging now. That's the, the line of march. Uh, and I want to start by saying that, that what this conference is doing, taking stock and uh, attempting to think about reigniting um, the, the, the political movement, is something that's happening far beyond these shores. Uh, that's a process that's happening around the world. Uh, for instance, in the United Nations circles at the moment, there's a lot of work of exactly this kind, rethinking and attempt of reigniting around the moment of the 20th anniversary of the Beijing Declaration, 1995. That anniversary comes up next year, and there will be a lot of activity uh, around it, which we can, uh, in, in, in various ways, connect with. Now, this Reigniting process, of course, is, is just one step in a long history. I'm sorry I wasn't here yesterday, but I gather that that, that history did come up um, in, in, in discussion. And I want to start also with that history of, of feminism and education, because we do have a, you know, a history of well over 100 years of, <coughs> uh, of work and, and thought in this area. Um, following on from the construction of modern <coughs> education systems in the 18th and 19th centuries, essentially as places for the education of boys and young men. So during the 19th century, in quite a, a, a number of different parts of the world, uh, what I think of as, as Agenda 1 of feminism and education developed, which was really uh, about um, creating uh, schools for girls, or at least access uh, to schools for girls, and literacy for women <coughs> on, on a, a, a societal scale. I want to show you two of the women who were involved in this process. <coughs> this is my great aunt Maud, <laughs> um, family, a photograph from, from the family album. Uh, Maud was one of that generation of Australian women who went to university before they could vote. Um, see, in the 1890s, uh, she went uh, to university. The family tradition doesn't say whether she was ever out there on the, the, the picket line uh, for the suffrage, uh, but she was certainly there in developing education for girls. Um, she took her university degree into the schools 
uh, worked and eventually wound up actually as headmistress of a school for girls over in Perth. The woman on the left uh, will be known to any of you who have spent time in Indonesia or are involved with Indonesian affairs, but probably not to anyone else. Uh, this is Kartini, who is a national heroine in Indonesia and the kind of patron saint of all feminist movements in Indonesia. Um, she was an important education reformer uh, who developed a critique of the position, she lived in, in Java in an upper class family, developed a critique of the position of women in her society and concluded that education was the way to change it. So she developed a program where, uh, of, of life and work where she would uh, refuse the conventional life path of becoming married and producing children for an upper class husband, um, decided to become a teacher, to found schools, because there were no schools for girls available, uh, and thus trigger uh, an educational process of social reform in gender relations. The story is in one way very sad because she didn't get support for this project beyond a certain level from her family. She didn't get support from the colonial government. This was the Dutch East Indies at the time. And eventually, under heavy social pressure, agreed to marry and died in childbirth with her first pregnancy. But her writing survived and was published posthumously and became a bestseller. <laughs> and is now regarded as a great classic of colonial literature. Um, and she is, in fact, I think, a quite significant figure in the history of world feminism and one of that first generation of education reformers from a feminist point of view whom we ought to know about and celebrate. The, what I think of as Agenda 2, the, the second wave, if you like, of, um, of feminism in education, is the one associated with the women's liberation movement. Um, and in Australia, took the particular, particular shape because of the connection that was established between uh, women's liberation movement and the Labour Party's presence in politics and, and access to state power. One key result of which was this absolutely amazing document from 1975. Uh, if anyone hasn't read it, find it and read it. It is, as far as I know, the first national level education policy document from a feminist perspective anywhere in the world. Um, it's really a stunning, <coughs> pioneering piece of educational thought. And we might regard its gender analysis as a little unsophisticated now, sex role theory and that kind of stuff. But in its context, it was astonishing. And it did trigger a generation of change in school systems around Australia on a whole range of fronts, women's employment rights, uh, curriculum issues, girls into science and technology, the GEN, if you remember that amazing <laughs> national magazine. Again, unique in the world as far as I know. Um, stunning stuff. So we had then what I think of as, as Agenda Mark II, uh, which involved an attempts to desegregate institutions, this was the head of the co-educational high school, uh, to undo sexism in the curricula and textbooks and so on and so forth, to invent new pedagogies, feminist classroom practices uh, in universities as well as, as the schools, <coughs> and find ways of supporting women uh, in positions of authority as principals, heads of department professors and so forth. And this, this agenda really did have quite a lot of success. It had significant national political presence in a series of national gender equity programs and policies. This was the National Action Plan, as it was in the early 1990s. Um, uh, the presence of, uh, of girls in upper levels of high school and universities and young women in universities did rise. Um, and a whole lot of curriculum reforms were indeed made. Um, there was you know, incredibly inventive work and, and a great deal of success. Um, 
But there was also a lot of resistance, as, as those who went through those processes were involved in those politics, we remember. And eventually, a um, very politically successful counter-movement in the form of the, the What About Boys movement, uh, which uh, effectively, with the support of a, a, a reactionary national government, derailed the gender equity policy process at a national level. So after about 1996, after the national framework and the, the very creative conference which you had asked about, um, we have really had very little by way of a coherent gender equity uh, program uh, at a national level. So to my mind, uh, despite the creativity uh, and strength of the work uh, of that generation, Agenda 2 is still unfinished. There's a lot of unfinished business uh, that's left. Uh, for instance, around segregation in, gender edu uh, in, in education institutions. And unfortunately, I have to say, as the neoliberal grip on, on public policy has tightened, and in education that's largely taken the form of a privatization of the education system through the back door, through fee regime in universities, through public subsidies to private schools um, in the school sector, uh, we've had an intensification of gender segregation in at least some parts of the school system. So we now see advertising for subsidised private schools like this, which emphasise one sort of gender model, and like this, for the boys kind. Uh, these, are, these are the front pages of the school's web presence, so this is very prominent in their representation of themselves. And you, you, know, you can not only see the segregation, the, the gender stereotyping which is involved uh, in their, their public presentation. So that part of Agenda 2 is still unfinished. Similarly, the attempts at curriculum reform, curriculum change, are unfinished. We still have, in various ways, deeply impoverished learning in Australian school systems. If you simply look at the curriculum divisions that emerge at upper secondary level, with a massive predominance of girls in areas like drama, uh, performing, performing arts, literature, and so forth, and a predominance of boys in areas like engineering, computing, uh, mathematics, <coughs> and physics. So there's a kind of gender-based vanishing act that kicks in in upper secondary, and we haven't solved that problem. Uh, and I don't even want to think about areas like sex education, which is still an educational disaster here in, in Australia, as in many other parts of the world. And while all this going on or not going on in schools, we have social processes forming the consciousness and practices of young people uh, in, in ways that embed you know, well-known forms of gender toxicity, stereotype, gender stereotyping in mass media uh, through uh, representations like this, and of course the massive focus on forms of, of entertainment um, like um, um, commercial football, uh, which uh, form a, a display of, of aggressive, physically dominating masculinities. That's what's really being sold here. And the position of women in marginalised or purely supportive uh, roles. And also forms of toxicity that invest the lives of girls specifically, uh, such as the preoccupation with body shape and slimness that uh, in, in, as in this uh, pro and a website uh, uh, lead to, to devastation in, in the lives of, of certain girls. So a lot of unfinished business, I think, which we have to carry forward in new circumstances and, and new, through new practices. So I want to turn now to think about what those new circumstances are. 
uh, what is the change situation that we find ourselves in now in the second decade of the 21st century. And I want to suggest that we, we need to think about changes in feminism itself, changes in the social context in which we're operating, and changes in education. So um, between you know the night between girls' school and society and now. Uh, feminism itself has changed uh, very markedly. Um, feminism globally uh, now has experiences of massive success, and this is perhaps the most revolutionary achievement of global feminism in the last generation, that is the transformation of literacy rates among women around the world. This is a graph of, of illiteracy rates, so turn it around, you see what, what we have. Um, achieved. Um, feminism has been impacted and transformed by new intellectual movements, which will be very familiar to the people in this room, by structural feminism, the new work around men and masculinities, queer theory, indigenous knowledge movements, the new feminist materialism, and more. Um, so, uh, and, and perhaps, to my mind, the most important single shift um, in, intellectually in feminism uh, in, in the last generation has been increasing recognition of the global arena and the global diversity of feminist movements and feminist thought. So if we're looking at uh, for work on gender and education, Although it's absolutely rock bottom academic custom in this country to look to Britain and the United States for our intellectual lead and our models of practice, it is now really important to recognize that there is creative, important, and interesting work going on in places like Brazil, South Africa, India, some of which are very hard to access, some of which are in other languages, but we should be part, we should be aware of this and doing something to access that, that part of it that is uh, actually available to us in, 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 in English, which indeed a good part of it is. So I want to call attention to a really quite important Australian contribution to this discussion, that is Chilla Bulbeck's work on global feminism, which goes back a number of decades. And this is a very important book about the issues that arise in linking feminisms in different cultural and economic situations around the world. It came out, I think, in 1997, um, and uh, it is still a, a terrific read uh, and, and uh, raises immense important issues. So that's the if you like, uh, political um, uh, experience, new intellectual frameworks uh, for feminism, and also new forms of feminist practice. Uh, one of which, I guess, one would call corporate feminism. Um, that is the, uh, the, the uh, practices around the pursuit of equal opportunity and gender justice in, in the corporate world, uh, which occasionally uh, surfaces, if, if you like, culturally uh, at moments when, for instance, the newspapers report uh, the awards like this is Woman of the Year. Um, but at the more radical end of things, uh, incredibly interesting uh, stuff coming up in forms of, of cyber feminism, online activism, beyond the kind of networking um, that I'm familiar with. Um, so just to illustrate that, something that he will have been involved in the Destroy the Joint movement, which has done lovely online stuff like this, and like this, uh, which I think is a terrific educational resource too. And if you go look at there's more and more and more of that kind of resource out there from, from different parts of the world. So um, then there are changes in the social context in which feminist movements are operating. And in Australia, the 
you know, undoubtedly the crucial uh, change that we have to grapple with is the advent of neoliberal uh, policy regimes in politics and economic restructuring, which is very closely connected with the, the new marketplace politics. Now, neoliberalism in Australia is not the same as neoliberalism in the United States and Europe. Um, and that's really, I think, quite important for us to understand. Economically speaking, Australia is part of the global south, not part of the global metropole. And neoliberalism around the global south, around the periphery, has essentially meant uh, economic restructuring associated with the growth of global markets. Um, and the, uh, it's meant an abandonment of state-based industrialization, modernization agendas, which Australia was doing in the era of Chifley, Menzies, and so forth. We industrialized with state support for capitalist industrialization. We followed that trend too. Neoliberalism around the global south has meant an abandonment of that kind of project. So, of course, we are de-industrializing. We have de-industrialized, in fact, quite strikingly. And we lose the, the motor manufacturing industry. Is it next year or the year after? And we've lost most of the steel industry, manufacturing industry, employment by, by and large. Um, but we have, uh, like other parts of the global south, looked to replace that development strategy with a development strategy based on looking for comparative advantage in global markets. What can we market more cheaply than others can do? And because we're a high wage economy, it's hard to do with services by and large, but we do have lots of coal and iron ore and nickel and so forth. So we now have a mining driven economy with again, enormous consequences for the economy, for employment, and I think also for education, because an economy controlled by transnational corporations engaging in digging up stuff and shipping it to industrialized countries is actually a society, or an economy rather, that doesn't need a strong public education system. We don't actually need this, or at least the ruling economic powers don't actually need this. And I think that's one of the underlying reasons for the gradual disinvestment in higher, public higher education that has occurred in Australia over the last 25 years, and for the obvious lack of interest by the, the dominant policy makers in having a, a high-performing public school system. It's not needed by the, by the new economy. The result of that, increasing educational inequalities, but that's simply part of a wider picture of increasing economic inequalities under the neoliberal regime, which happens all around the world, I might say, with neoliberalism, and of course increasing insecurity for the relatively marginalized groups, including young people. So the experience of economic insecurity is now a mass experience for young people in, the same, in a way that a generation ago wasn't true. Now, <clears throat> that's all, I guess, sort of familiar. Um, but it's important to think of this, not as something that just descends from the sky uh, or, or is produced by gravity in the way that neoliberal economists would like us to think, um, but to realize it's associated with new power centers, with new strategies of powerful groups. So we have a reshaped ruling class in Australia. Whoops, sorry, that was just to illustrate the, the fact that we do up coal. <laughs> uh, you can see where I've learnt my pedagogy. Okay, well here's our new ruling class. Any anyone recognise any of the um, the lovely um, blokes in the picture? Uh, having a a little time off, but maybe also selling a few billion shares by mobile phone as they do. Um, okay, now neoliberalism is directly associated with shifts in gender power. Uh, complex, but uh, I'm going to be quite crude. Uh, I think uh, this 
time, this you know, moment in, in global economic change, is associated with the creation of new patriarchal centers in forms of patriarchy. So the, the kind of policy thinking which thinks gender inequality is all a matter of ancient tradition and old fashioned stuff and you know what our grandparents did simply isn't looking at what's happening around them. We are seeing new power centers emerging, new forms of male dominance, uh, new forms of political masculinity. So our, our friend Putin, this was a picture actually taken on when he was on his way to Australia for the Asia Pacific Economic Forum some years back. Um, but you have there the enactment of a very, very specific form of masculinity, which it seems to be doing pretty well uh, in terms of his domestic politics in Russia. Um, and you also have more, if you like, less uh, personalized forms of masculinity, such as the collective masculinity of the government of China. What you're looking at there is a meeting of the Central Committee of the Communist Party of China, you know, which was, remember, Women hold up half the sky, the gender revolution that was coming out of China. Well, this is what's happened. Uh, this is what we've now got. Um, so, that, I mean, this is different from the story in Russia, um, but uh, nevertheless, you are still getting consolidated, new forms of consolidated patriarchal power. And you're also getting new forms of gender-based violence emerging at different parts of the neoliberal world. This is a scene just outside the Mexican city of Juarez in northern Mexico, right beside the border with the United States, where uh, uh, about 15, I think it's about 15 years ago, no, maybe 20 years ago, um, a woman, a retired accountant, uh, became concerned at the number of women's bodies who were turning out in the desert outside the city. Um, and uh, she got alarmed by this, began documenting the number of killings of women, especially young women, um, and eventually raised a, a kind of policy outcry which <coughs> resonated across Mexico and eventually became an international movement. <coughs> Mexican feminists called this femicide, by analogy with genocide, kind of mass killings of women, one by one in this case, but the effect was the same as massacre. Um, and, uh, you know, I've been part of an international of a solidarity group um, in, in Australia trying to support the, the international Mexican campaign to, to develop pressure against this. Now, the important thing uh, is that this is not about traditional patriarchy or traditional masculinity. This is, uh, Juarez is actually a neoliberal city which has burned enormously in the new neoliberal economy they have maquiladoras, those export clothing factories, uh, producing cheap goods for the American market. They're also the main transshipment port uh, place for the drug trade, uh, which is a neoliberal triumph of the world, but, um, which, but which is also extremely violent and creates a, you know, a certain culture of, of violent masculinity, which is undoubtedly sort of complicit in the killings of women. So I, I don't want to pursue this uh, in, in any depth, but I want to, to say that we are getting extreme gender toxicity coming up out of neoliberalism, as well as all of the other effects in uh, different parts of the globe. But there are also kind of new things. Um, uh, not everything in neoliberalism is new. Um, and we have, uh, among other important continuities, the economic subordination of women, economic privileging of men, and since the newspapers from time to time report figures on the difference between women's wages and men's wages, it's important to realize that those figures which show, what is it, 15 percent, something like that difference, are 17 or 18 percent now are uh, for comparable forms of employment. But when you aggregate it across the whole economy, women's actual incomes as a group are more like 58 or 60 percent of men's than they are like 80 or 90 percent. 
So um, major economic inequalities between women as a group and men as a group. And of course, the continued presence of ideologies, representations in mass media, and widespread popular acceptance of ideologies of natural gender difference between men and women, which are then involved in all kinds of educational effects around expectations of employment, uh, childcare, and so forth. Which brings me then to the changes in education. Under neoliberalism, educational systems are also impacted, not only at a policy level, but in the way education institutions work. Uh, and under neoliberalism, education is redefined from being you know, fundamentally public service, a necessary social function, to being an industry. Yeah. There's probably lots of accounts out of which people can make uh, large amounts of money as we saw in the preschool sector uh, with that appalling fiasco of ABC Learning. Um, so educational institutions, schools, universities, most strikingly TAFE institutions are being redefined as firms, uh, expected to compete with each other, expected to generate surpluses, whether it's called profit or not. Um, it's uh, the same kind of thing. And policy settings are forcing these newly defined firms into a position of competing with each other rather than cooperating with, with each other as a public uh, education system is <coughs> expected to do. And the result of that is this kind of garbage, uh, which I feel entitled to insult this university because I'm a graduate of it. <laughs> um, I'm appalled. This is our number one university. Come on. Uh, the implicit thing is we don't depend on the other universities. Um, we are number one. We are out there in front. We are better. We are different. We are self-contained and so forth. In fact, universities massively depend on each other. Uh, and they wouldn't function, actually, except as part of a system in which there is a great deal of mutual support and cooperation. Education has been, in this era, I think, reconfigured in ways that are intended to support the new structures of power and wealth. Um, so the increase of private wealth, the shift of assets from public sector to private sector, and the increase in inequalities of wealth and income, the education system is being redesigned to support this kind of thing. At one level, ideologically, simply by the uh, enormous increase of insistence on competitiveness and ranking, testing, you know, national testing regimes, international testing regimes, university ranking scales, citation indexes, and so on and so forth. You know, all of this kind of stuff. But also in the institutional mechanisms too. So we are getting new forms of exclusion in through school systems associated with the hierarchies and the pattern of funding of educational institutions. And again, I think the university sector is the most sickening example of this with the group of eight attempting to put their foot on essentially all the research resources in the national system. Although universities have not yet been as devastated by these agendas as the TAFE sector has. So <coughs> these are changes that we sort of all experience actually in our everyday lives. We feel them in our bodies. Um, and uh, I hope uh, and trust that to some extent at any rate, they generate reactions uh, and, and uh, push people to think actually what's going on in here. And I want, you know, I, I depart from the assumption that education is not there to support privilege, to support structures of privilege. It's not there to reproduce existing social hierarchies. <coughs> education is about the creation of society through time, and the continuity uh, and the, the, the new directions that can emerge in society. Um, and for that reason alone, education and gender 
have a deep connection. Gender is not marginal business for an education system, for the educational function in society. Gender is also about reproduction and continuity through time. It's about the way a society handles the fact of reproductive bodies, of human um, sexual reproduction, and the consequences uh, of, of that hand in, in social life. <coughs> and, and that deep connection, I guess, is what I want to suggest as the, if you like, the starting point for what I take it in a way the business of this conference is, or at any rate the direction this conference is leading, which is the creation of Agenda Number 3, uh, a new agenda for feminism in education, which has to move on from, certainly carry forward some of the issues from Agenda Number 2 from the Women's Liberation Era, but also has to do new things. And I'm going to finish with a suggestion about the, if you like, the sites on which this uh, ag an agenda number three has to work. Uh, the ground of, of thinking here is that social justice is not an add-on, including gender justice, not an add-on, but has to be woven through an education system. Um, I start also uh, thinking about this uh, in the consciousness that there are new political resources as well as new political problems for feminism. And one of them is the emergence of men's movements and men's groups like the White Ribbon Campaign, the Father's Month practices and policies in Scandinavia, anti-violence campaigns around South and Southeast Asia, and very important work in South Africa, in Southern Africa, which I'll, I'll mention again in a moment. So the sites on which a, a third, if you like, a third agenda for feminism and education can be constructed, I, I, I think of as three. Educational process, the educational workforce, and educational institutions. The <coughs> educational process, obviously there's been a lot of thinking about that in this conference already. Um, <coughs> it's, um, it's something that we have inherited, a concern that we've inherited from former generations of feminists. Um, and I will remind people that the greatest educational reformer in recent Australian history was a feminist woman, Jean Blackburn. Um, one of whose important contributions was the concept of a socially inclusive curriculum for schools embedded in the Blackburn Report for Victorian education. And that, I think, is a really good starting point for thinking about curriculum issues. Indeed, we have to move it on from where Jean was able to get with her particular uh, apparatus of thought. Um, but um, that's, to my mind, an absolutely central uh, set of issues. We also need new pedagogies, uh, which have been under discussion in this, in this conference. And when thinking about educational processes, again, I'd really emphasize gender questions are not a marginal question in education. Knowledge, understanding of gender, and educational processes around gender practices are very important to kids. If we're defining the kids' need, educational needs, these are pretty important components uh, of any, uh, I think, the real definition of children's needs. So again, this is core business for education, not a marginal set of considerations at all. Secondly, there are issues around the education workforce, um, the proportion of teachers, uh, of women in, in the teaching workforce in Australia is still rising. Um, and to my mind, teacher education is really one of the vital areas uh, for feminist work uh, as the, the, the workforce in the future is being formed. Um, but not only that, also industrial organizations of teachers, the teacher unions, professional associations, um, are also quite important in the shaping of the workforce of the future and therefore sites where feminist agendas uh, are necessary and indeed 
uh, uh, developing. Thirdly is the issue of, of educational institutions, the schools, the colleges, the universities, and the increasingly important online educational forums. These two are important sites um, of feminist work. Uh, and here I want to lean a little bit on the work that's been done in Africa, uh, specifically in South Africa. Uh, this is a really fascinating book, uh, part of a very impressive uh, research agenda uh, that's developed in South Africa, as well as practical agendas of school reconstruction um, since the end of apartheid. Uh, it's an incredibly tense and difficult uh, scene because the school system is massively impacted by HIV AIDS pandemic. And South Africa has the worst burden, the heaviest burden of AIDS of any country in the world. Um, a lot of it is sexually transmitted and reflective of gender inequalities in social life among young people in that country. So it's a tough scene, but there is really exciting research and practical work being done, which is relatively easy for us to access because most of it is in English. And I do really commend to you um, that work um, and, and those activists and researchers as a tremendous resource for our rethinking of how we can rebuild the educational institutions after neoliberalism. Because we now need to be thinking beyond the current moment of you know, being constantly impacted and disrupted to what we're going to replace the neoliberal education order with in the following, in the next generation. That's the kind of thinking we should be doing now. So I'm um, so we're wanting to to end by re-emphasizing the, the theme I've been sort of coming to uh, all along. Feminism in Australia at the moment is politically marginalized. We all know that. But feminism is not marginal as an issue in education. It is core business. The, the issues of gender equality, gender formation, the shaping of gender relations are central matters in education considered in a large social sense. And therefore, uh, gender equality, gender equity, is the core, one of the core features of a good society. And education around that is going to be one of the core features of good education. <laughs>